Good morning, everyone, and welcome to uh, Think and Link Brand New World um, with our goal of sharing ideas and inspiring change and, and really just sparking a bit of creativity and bringing everyone together today. Um, I am joined by my guest co-host, uh, Miss Kitty Hart, the VP of Client Engagement uh, for our current sponsor of Think and Link Dynamico. Um, Kitty, a former capsulite herself, Herself. So we're um, excited to have her back. I'm sure many in the audience today uh, know Kitty personally. So Kitty, we'll, we'll in a moment turn it over to you to give a little more background about Dynamico. Um, but we're also extremely excited to have our esteemed speakers, uh, Kate Mortensen, who's the founder and CEO of Ponder Global and iPonder, and Claire Coder, who is the founder of AntFlow. Hi, Claire. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to them in a moment. Um, to also further introduce themselves, uh, but wanna run through a, a couple of quick housekeeping items. Um, for those of you have, who have not joined us before, um, today's session is video on. We love to see all your beautiful and handsome faces, um, but audio off. Uh, but we do encourage uh, that little chat box there to your right. Um, we do encourage our audience members to include questions there for our guests as this discussion unfolds. Um, and Kitty and I will try to get as, to as many of those as, as we can. Um, we will have a recording of today's discussion available on the Capsule Design YouTube channel, um, which we'll put in the chat at the end of today's discussion as well. Um, but, uh, but very excited to, to have what we know will be an insightful and inspiring conversation with Kate and Claire. And uh, without further ado, I'm, I'm going to uh, quickly mention Capsule, obviously a, a brand strategy uh, research and design from here in Minneapolis. We're the primary sponsor of this Think and Link, but we also are lucky to have and excited to have a sponsor in Dynamico, a consulting firm um, with a tech platform background also here um, in Minneapolis. Um, and Kitty, I'll, I'll turn it over to you quickly, if you could give us a little background on Dynamico, and then we'll jump into our discussion. Yes, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, it's fun to be here. I'm excited to start this new um, sponsorship and engagement. Um, I'll be co-hosting once a month, um, which is great. And it kind of feels like we're getting the band back together in doing this. So um, appreciate the opportunity. So just a quick plug for Dynamico um, as a sponsor of Think and Link. As Kelly said, we are a technology consultancy. So we help companies grow and scale through the use of HubSpot. It's really that simple. Um, so if anyone is curious about how the right sales and marketing technology can be a flywheel for your growth, please reach out to me. Um, it's a really important um, component in today's world. Sales and marketing technology is not a nice to have. It is a mandatory in every industry and in every business. So, um, Thank you for allowing me to share that and happy to be here. Kelly, back to you. Great. Thanks, Kitty. And I know we'll have a lot of discussions around technology and this digital transformation we've we've seen, certainly, um, and, and how businesses can grow. Um, Kate, excited to hear a little bit more about that when we talk about iPonder. Would love to um, turn it over to both Kate and Claire to give a little more background about themselves and their journey. And, and Kate, we'll start with you, if you could. Absolutely. Good morning, everybody, and thank you so much to uh, Capsule and Dynamico for creating this opportunity for us to visit and share this morning and apply uh, thinking about design to the world that we live in every day. So my name is Kate Mortensen. I am the founder and the CEO of iPonder. Uh, iPonder is a media and technology company that is shaping a better culture and building a kinder America with human-centered storytelling in a breakthrough audio, video, narrative, and photography altogether platform uh, that is snackable, on the go, uh, but always insightful, sometimes uplifting, sometimes eye-opening. We take stories that are uh, often um, un undertold uh, or untold, and, and we lift them and give them context and give them dimension so that you can experience life outside your bubble uh, and, um, and feel that you are part of this, this greater uh, society of the United States of America, so. Great, Kate, thank you. Wonderful to have you and Claire. 
Hi, all. Yes, so glad to be here. My name is Claire. I'm the founder and CEO of Aunt Flo. Like, oh, I got my period. Aunt Flo is in town. Um, and I started my company after getting my period in public without a menstrual product. Uh, and what I have done is ask the question if toilet paper is offered in bathrooms outside of the home, why aren't tampons and pads? These products all respond to natural bodily functions. And so what my company does is we've designed and developed a patented tampon and pad dispenser so that businesses and schools and organizations can offer freely accessible menstrual products to their employees, students, and guests. Wonderful. A great story, Claire. And I'm excited to hear more about that. Uh, so let's let's dive dive right in. Kitty, I think you have a first question for our guest. Yes. Um, so, you know, in uh, within Think and Link, we have a lot of conversations around um, entrepreneurship. Um, we have a lot of conversations around purpose driven and mission driven organizations. So we'll, we'll focus on that topic. Um, so mission statements are meant to reflect commitment to a higher social good for the community that they serve, local, locally and globally. Both of your organizations were created and driven by a mission to do better or to be better. How do you articulate your organization's purpose through marketing, human-centered design, and the brand? Kate, why don't we start with you? Sure. Well, the origins of iPonder are, are really uh, these past number of years, seeing how traditional media fails us, uh, fails to really deeply inform us, fails to contextualize the news of the day, actually promotes polarization, leaves us feeling anger, outrage, anxiety, other emotions that sure, they're sticky, uh, but they don't serve us. Uh, and so uh, with a background in journalism and with a global mindset and a desire to see a better functioning culture, uh, we, we founded iPonder. Um, and so iPonder, again, is, is, is better media that uh, more fully expresses uh, the lived experience of whatever might be in the headlines today, whatever might be debated in Washington. We actually take you into what does it feel like what to be living that, whether it be gender experience, whether it be uh, faith or something geographical, urban, rural, uh, you know, lots of really interesting things to explore in the workplace uh, for women and men, caregiving, uh, dimensions of health, including mental health and wellness. We're, we're, we're talking about real life and we absolutely ooze authenticity uh, and really invite engagement from folks who, who want to uh, listen and watch and read uh, and then ponder a little bit, you know, give yourself a few minutes. Uh, to think and react and respond to our empathetic storytelling, uh, open up your world a bit and life outside your bubble. So, so, so that is um, that is our goal. And you know, I it's hard for me to articulate mission. It's easier for me to just live mission. I'm very much a let's do, and then someone else can write down what it is that what what we're doing. But we did when we started our company. In our articles of incorporation, we did state that we uh, exist to, to foster a more interconnected society mm -hmm. and develop the traits of cultural and global competence. Now that can get a little wonky, so you know the me the media is very uh, entertaining, uh, but the the se the secret plan is to hack into mainstream society with a new way of thinking about each other, a way of uh, being better, as you say, and and doing better. Um, yeah. So in our design, in our strategies, um, we really start, we started with a, a, you know, a logo that expresses um, a coming together of, of people from random places of difference. It is a bench. Uh, there was a, a lot to do with it, 
a lot of people uh, get it, some people don't, but the people who get it are like, oh, that reminds me of Forrest Gump sitting on that bench, meeting all kinds of random people, and then having these ex amazing exchanges that were actually quite beautiful, and then they part. Um, so actually from the very beginning, um, as we think about everything we do and we say in all of our social channels, with our content, we're, we're really asking, ready to shape a better culture, uh, you know, come experience life outside your bubble. We've copyrighted our taglines, uh, building a kinder America. We, we really want to um, have that be very clear and differentiating from, from other forms of media. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Yeah. Very good. Claire, same question. How do you articulate the organization's purpose across the organization through marketing, through the design? Mm, yeah. So our mission at AntFlow is to make the world better for people with periods. And right now, one of the hardest parts about talking about our company is people don't naturally want to talk about menstruation. They want to talk about tampons like tampons. Like yeah. nobody has ever said tampon out loud. They whisper it, they hide menstrual products up their sleeve when they go to the bathroom. And so when we think about our mission of making the world better for people with periods, first, we have to make sure people talk about menstruation because everybody on this call is has either menstruated or knows somebody that menstruates. And so even in our brand, our brand is Aunt Flo, which is a euphemism for menstruation. And so we're even chipping away at our mission of making the world better for people with periods. Every time we send an invite for somebody that's a director of facilities that says, Director of Facilities is meeting with Aunt Flo. How hilarious is that? Other people see it on the calendar that, um, you know, imagine all of your Director of Facilities, um, probably not menstruators, and they're having meetings with Aunt Flo. And so when we think about our mission of making the world better for people with periods, it goes even from our brand name to engage in inclusivity and start the conversation. And then all the way through to making the world better for people with periods, to placing menstrual products in bathrooms to ensure people have access when they need it. And then of course, improving on the products. That means quality, that means sustainability. And that means of course, um, ensuring that the products are always accessible to folks. So when we think about our mission, making the world better for people with periods, it goes all the way back to as simple as our name. Mm -hmm. If I may just comment on that, I think that what Claire Coder is doing with Aunt Flo is, is really normalizing a human function that we all rely on for life, um, that exists all over the planet um, and impacts every one of us. But it, it can impact very, very negatively uh, women's ab you know, ability to pursue education. Um, in the developing world, oftentimes, there isn't sanitation um, available and women stop school. And when women aren't learning and, and, and growing, you know, their, their communities aren't um, achieving their best. And so the, you know, the idea to kind of bring to the fore these ideas that often fall off the table or don't feel like they're things we can talk about. It could be mental health. It could be, you know, it could be pregnancy loss. It could be family caregiving. Um, you know, uh, down to something as elemental as having the, you know, the, the products that, that you need kind of in your toolkit for every day. Um, I think it's a really, really important um, um, mission and one that I hope our, um, our male uh, colleagues can, can recognize and just start getting comfortable with a new way of thinking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great way to put it. Yeah, Kate. Oh, thank you both. What uh, great stories of inspiration just in terms of purposeful, meaningful work that you're doing. Um, and if we, if we could take that to, uh, I know Kitty mentioned um, entrepreneurship and, and we, I think we have a lot of entrepreneurs on the call with us today. It's, it's quite impressive. Um, you know, first, let's start with you, Claire. You started your first company at the age of 16. And I'm going to talk about that. I think it was a button company, if I remember correctly, but I want to, want to dig into that. And, and then, Kate, of course, you've, you've helped build and lead organizations across sectors um, you know, over the course of your career. Would love to hear both of your perspectives. When we talk about, just personally, those key characteristics that you found were pretty critical and crucial, both those hard and soft skills. Um, 
that were critical for, for, you know, really leaning into entrepreneurship um, and taking, having the courage to know that I could likely fail and fail hopefully fast and forward and, and learn from those mistakes. But share some of those skills that you've learned or have witnessed um, in, in your own careers. Uh, if you could start, Kate, and, and then Claire, we'll, we'll jump into your, your story as well. Thoughts? Sure. When I think about uh, some of the great, I, I feel super fortunate. I, I've lived in different parts of the world. Um, I have in uh, traveling and relocating often been the trailing spouse, which is, uh, you know, like needs a better marketing spin, but um, it, it's, it's every time a chance to go back to the beginning and say, okay, what is most important? community, how do I engage in the community? And to be able to kind of condense down those activities to how do I find the people that I wanna be around? I wanna be around ideas people. So of course, you know, I'm gonna support my kids in their schooling, but my head is kind of looking around for people who are fixing and bettering community. Mm -hmm. um, and so as, um, as my opportunities grew to have influence, as I tried this and found like, wow, maybe this is kind of a superpower that I have, which is um, connecting people around big ideas and bringing together the financial resources and the buy-in and the volunteer support and business and government and philanthropy. It's something that you know I, I can see and I can do and I a little bit take it for granted as I think most people do what their superpower is. They're like, oh, well, that, that's easy, but what I can't do is this over here. So really learning it, learning what my uh, core capability is, what is special and unique about what is in my toolbox, and then working to really develop that. So each time I take on um, a, new, a new level of uh, complication in, in one of my, my projects or enterprises, always bringing tenacity, always bringing belief, and always bringing resilience. Because um, I'll tell you, if, if you're trying to do something that hasn't been done before, you know, people that you ask about the possibility for that to be perhaps a better way, I mean, they're not all like, yeah, for sure. I mean, people riding around on horses weren't like, can't wait to get the first crack at an automobile. You know, there, it just takes time for people to kind of come along. And so you meet a lot of people when you're trying to do something different and big who it's not that they're not rooting for you, especially if you have an idea that could, could create a better community and foster a better society. It's just, they, they don't believe it. And so you have to carry the belief of others um, until you can enact what it is that, that you had in mind and, and show and be like, see? Um, and so I get actually energy from people who, um, and in my own uh, enterprise now with I Ponder, where people are like, you're gonna what? You're gonna create a new form of media. That media is really hard. It's such a noisy marketplace. Mm -hmm. The uh, the players are so established. Um, all of the the business the business model is locked in. And and I don't think that any of those things are true. I think it's super ready for disruption. And I think that there is a way to turn it on its ear, on its cynical ear, and actually take back some of what public purpose. Uh, should be in media and ensure that media is, is supporting, um, guess what, uh, you and me and our, our need to know and deeply understand the communities that we live in so, so, we, so we can contribute. So that's that belief, that's that resilience. Mm -hmm. I used to joke with my children when I had a tough time, you know, in some, something I was trying to do, I'd come home and I'd be like, well, kids, you know, like the get-go lizard, I, mom kind of got her tail cut off today but I'm gonna grow another one. And it got to the point where they would be like, oh my God, Ma, here goes mom again with her metaphors of you know, learning and growing through adversity. But I would add to that, that, um, that for me, and hopefully going forward for every single person who hears this, equity is the way to develop any good idea. It's a byproduct of the success of your idea. It, it will ensure that your idea is aligned with the future of society 
and the development goals for the whole world that the United Nations has put forward as in the sustainable development goals. So doing um, whatever it is that we're doing with equity front and center means you're not gonna have to go back later and unbuild and undo something that isn't really unlocking the full potential of all people because you didn't think of it in the, in the first place. So I guess that's the last thing I would say is, I said tenacity, belief, resilience, not everybody's gonna give you a round of applause. Mm -hmm. um, it's tough out there, let me tell you, less than 2% of VC money goes to women-owned businesses. Mm. Less than 1% goes to people of color businesses. So I'm twice as lucky as the black woman who's trying to start a business. Mm -hmm. So I'm experiencing that, which is sort of like, oh yeah, I guess, you know, I've got all these, all this privilege, but I'm still a woman. Mm -hmm. and launching a business. So that resilience is really important. But if you build your business and build your idea with equity in mind, then you're locking in future success at the beginning. Thank you for sharing. That's, that's quite impressive. And surrounding yourself, as you're saying, this diversity of thought, the people that not only support your idea, but it get, you're getting different perspectives to build that team to, to move it forward. So, okay, that's yeah. impressive. Thank you. Thank I you think it's that. really critical, the diverse, diversity of thought piece uh, especially, you know, when when le when leaders are are comfortable, um, mm -hmm. then you know th they don't mind different points of view. Um, different points of view are intellectually interesting, and they are different paths and channels. And sometimes there is an easier way to get from A to B. And so, especially with an with an entrepreneurial venture, we do find a lot with our senior team. And with the age diversity, with the racial diversity that we have, the, the as I said, generational gender diversity, geographic diversity mm -hmm. on my lead team, you know, I, I do get I do get that um, that pushback that you know that that pushes on kind of my resilience and my ability to kind of you know ha have that um, you know. Where does, what would water do now? You know, how do, how do we kind of move, always moving forward? But um, group think is, yeah, I think a uh, very outdated, uh, you know, concept. Right, right. Thank you, Kate. Great, very insightful. Uh, Claire, let's turn it over to you. Let's talk about entrepreneurship. And the ripe young age of 16 is when you began that journey. Can you share a little bit about about that journey and then also again what characteristics did you have to pull forward to really help you build and, and grow and become yes um, who you are <laughs> well kelly i i want to go back to what kate said right like entrepreneurs rare like it's very lonely to be an entrepreneur and nobody's just applauding you all of the time and so for our people that are listening who are entrepreneurs or are thinking about becoming an entrepreneur would love to see the reaction of the clap like give yourself a clap um on this zoom call like let's see it um where are entrepreneurs at um, but in terms of building my company like when i started my first company which was when i was in high school it wasn't um, I'm, I'm from Toledo, Ohio. And so I would never consider myself an entrepreneur. I was not ever wanting to be an entrepreneur. It's not a career track that I knew about or was striving towards. Um, when I was in high school, I had a button maker and I started making buttons and magnets and compact mirrors for my friends and my family. And I started charging money for those buttons and magnets and compact mirrors. And before I knew it, I was generating um, some significant profit. I started selling on Etsy. I became a top seller on Etsy. Um, and uh, I did get that title of entrepreneur. And then it's funny how um, when you have the idea for a company, you kind of happenstance into becoming the CEO. And no one ever wants to be the CEO. Being a founder is fun. Being a CEO is the worst job ever. It really, truly is, especially if you're coming at it from a founder perspective. Um, and so I'll talk about entrepreneurs and what makes them specifically unique. And then obviously um, the lessons that I've learned now as a CEO for a company, 
um, that is, is almost five years old and growing and is in a very state in the country and um, over $10 million in business. And so talk about a little bit about that. But when I started, I was not planning to be an entrepreneur and I definitely was not planning to be a CEO. I just knew that I loved selling things and I loved seeing people's reactions to the product when they bought it. Um, and so when I started Ant Flow, which is my company now, um, mm -hmm. I started it when I was 18. So I had my button company for high school and then I left university to start Ant Flow when I was 18 years old. And it was really just me and an idea and a mission to ensure that people had access to menstrual products. Um, and that um, moment in entrepreneurship, what made it possible was I solved problems that were intimate to me. Entrepreneurs solve problems that are intimate to them. And those are the successful businesses. The farther away the problem is to you, the harder it is to actually solve for it, right? Like there are people that come to me all the time and they're like, oh, I've seen people in and out like people in third world countries who don't have access to tampons and pads and I want to go over and donate products to them that problem is not intimate to you right now and the problem is is you'll go there and you'll learn that there are no sanitary waste receptacles there is no um whole infrastructure to support disposable products you need to train folks um, in different areas and especially in third world countries to make their own menstrual products. So it's there every single month because menstruation is a recurring event. Um, and so the closer the problem is, the more effective you can be. In addition to that, entrepreneurs take a lot of risk. And we all know this. Um, and uh, every time somebody starts a company or giving up something, right? Like I gave up a salary for two years. I still to this day am making risk after risk. We are required to make fast and quick decisions. Um, and then eventually we turn from a founder who is solving intimate problems that are close to us and taking risks every day. And eventually we're catapulted into the CEO position. And a CEO, your job is to mitigate risk and determine the direction for the company, which is a very, very different skill set than a standard founder and entrepreneur. And so um, just highlighting that because entrepreneurship is so much more fun. And then, bef then before you know it, then you have to become the CEO, um, which is not as fun, but it's delightful in its own ways. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Yes. Just in your perspective, you're right. Moving from the risk taker to the risk averse role because you're protecting your business. Um, it, is a, it is certainly a mind shift. Thank you, Claire, for sharing. Kitty. Kitty, I think you're muted. That's okay. <laughs> I think it's really clear that both Kate and Claire are born entrepreneurs. Not everybody is. Not everybody has that. Yeah. And so I've been curious about the fact that now you can major in entrepreneurship. And I, I mean, I have to admit, I don't know a lot about that major. I don't know what is involved in the coursework, but it does raise the question, you know, you can go and get an education in this. Um, but I think you have to have that, that something else within you that really will um, allow you to be successful in it. So just an observation. Mm -hmm. Kate, you seem to be aligning with that. Yeah, actually, I was at a, a, a conference recently of uh, billion dollar exits and the, their, their founders and you know, they, they were all like a little kind of dizzy and lightheaded with the news that they were going to have a billion dollar exit. And they were incredibly generous to, to share with uh, those who were, you know, earlier on in that journey uh, mm -hmm. about, you know, what was involved, what were some big change moments, you know, when did they have to pivot and be agile and, and turn this dial up and turn that dial down. And, and um, you know, I heard from all of them, like there's certain truths People say about young kids like, oh, make sure you pay attention because it happens, it all happens so fast. That's true. Um, <laughs> a truth about business is, um, or entrepreneurship is you may think you know how it's going to go, but you don't. So get ready for that wild ride. And I think that, you, you know, there are people who are, who are made for that. I actually, I, I love the, the roller coaster aspect. Um, I sometimes wish I knew kind of what the next chapter was going to look like uh, with more, you know, more certainty, but I think that we're getting closer and um, closer to that with I Ponder, mm -hmm. especially as we have uh, moved into the workforce space with a product um, called I Ponder at Work, which is a curricularized SaaS licensable 
uh, version of pondering where you are living life outside your bubble and understanding the experience of others with the goal of fostering empathy. Mm -hmm. I mean, suddenly empathy, psychological, um, security, you know, security, belonging, authenticity, those supposed soft skills are actually the new table stakes for mm -hmm. um, successful businesses. Um, and, that, and that's a really interesting kind of flip. Uh, and then of course you need on top of that, you know, all of the skills and capabilities that every part of your enterprise does need. But, but we all need to have uh, more human kindness, the capability to interact with others, the ability to put ourselves in other people's shoes, especially as our workplaces are becoming more and more diverse, especially as we live in this global world um, where one box away from me on a Zoom call could, could be a person whose life I, I will never know very closely, um, but should have curiosity about uh, and better understanding of in order to contextualize it and to show the, you know, the right respect to, to that person that they, that they deserve. And we're all humans. We go into the workplace and our, our human stuff comes with us. Uh, members of my team are right now finding care, giving organizations for their elderly parents. Uh, you know, members of our, our, our team, uh, and we are a woman-led company, and we are a majority non-white organization, which is very rare in media, and I think part of the problem for why the storytelling hasn't been there, because there's been no legitimate way to tell the story of what it is like to be uh, African-American living in a small town, or what it is like to be um, a, a woman coming back into the workplace after, you know, just five, six weeks and just had her third child. And, you know, how, how's that going to work? Oh, well, it's just going to work somehow. Um, so get, actually getting into these stories is, um, I think, a real absolute critical thing. So, so the I Ponder at Work uh, part of our business, um, we envision, will, will really uh, allow us to convert, you know, hundreds and thousands of people uh, to this very mindful process of becoming more thoughtful and becoming kinder and um, fostering that empathy that is going to um, to, to make teams uh, per perform better. And so I I might have wandered from what the question was there, but yeah, that that's good. And I I, I wrote down um, the first time you said life outside your bubble. Um, and I mean, just, we just, we know how extremely important that is. And I think at some point on Think and Link, we've reiterated something that we learned many, many years ago. We heard a speaker talk about this at a conference where he said, the next big innovation in your industry will come from another industry. So you better be paying attention to what's going on outside of your walls. Um, so that's that specific component that you're launching is is um, really smart and I can totally see the need for it. So it, it's a good segue into talking about technology, um, which is is our next question. As we all know, the world that we live in is so technology technologically advanced. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the digital transformation that's happening in and around our businesses. Curious to know from both of you, can you share how, how you're using digital platforms inside your own organizations to optimize efficiencies and then also positive impacts that you've witnessed um, just in the world uh, from the use of technology? Um, why don't we start with Claire? Oh man, I mean, we're all here on a virtual webinar, right? I'm in Ohio. I'm sure people on this call are from all over the United States. And so obviously that's a clear and direct impact that we can all come together. Mm -hmm. um, for, for us, uh, leveraging technology has been pretty innate in our company from the beginning. Um, we have always been on Slack. We've always been electronically communicating um, and it's, it's been pretty native 
for our team. Um, so I'm not sure that I can speak too much to this. Um, obviously, it directly impacts our business if nobody ever wants to go back outside because we rely on people menstruating outside of the home. Um, so hopefully people don't love technology too much that they never go back to the office or they never go to a concert um, or they never go to a convention at the Columbus Convention Center, all of our customers, right? Um, and so that's one thing that we are monitoring of how how much are people relying on technology now and potentially in the future and how will that impact where we do business? Um, yeah. So th that's how we, what we think about when we think about technology. Well, I love this question because we are a technology company and we are a digital company. So we, are, we, we create uh, media in audio, in video, in narrative and in photography and then through digital means um, at iPonder.com, make that available uh, to whomever, wherever. So we're about America, but we're for anyone. And 10 weeks into launch, what we saw is that across all 50 states, people want to ponder. Um, in Washington, DC, they really intensive, intensely ponder, which is a very good thing, I submit. Even outside of the country where we're not putting any uh, marketing effort. Um, you know, we, we have 162 countries around the world that someone is coming onto iPonder.com to, to look at and enjoy our, our stories. Um, the most intense pondering outside of the United States isn't, as you might think, Canada or the UK. It's actually India. Quite fascinating. Hmm. We are born in this world. 75% um, of our audience is accessing us uh, by mobile technology, which is fantastic because you know we're in the cord cutting revolution. And so we're, we wanna be here and we wanna be here in a way that isn't a legacy media that is, for example, newspaper trying to look good on a phone. You know, we're, we're also not trying to be, um, you know, a fabulous uh, uh, broadcast, video product that you you can also read. I mean, this has been a struggle for our traditional media to sort of get over the fact mm -hmm. that whatever it is that they used to do or be is not what the customer wants. The customer wants video when they want video, they want audio when they want audio, they want really good narrative journalism. Sometimes they want photography, they want to be able to bookmark, they want to be able to send, share, uh, comment. Uh, and so, you know, we, I think we've been waiting a long time for that breakthrough. Uh, so we're really excited. Our designers are the designers of Masterclass. So having a beautiful product and a beautiful experience of a much less frustrating uh, news and media uh, uh, content is, is, you know, part of our value proposition, you know, and, and further, um, you know, the internet writ large is that forest that Little Red Riding Hood's grandmother said, don't go in there. I mean, it really is a place increasingly where you enter with your innocent curiosity, let's presume, and, and things are taken from you. Uh, I mean, as soon as you step in, things are taken from you. Your information, your whereabouts, your IP, your, the, sometimes your, you know, your, your credit card is stolen before you, you even know. And, um, and so the, the cynical aspect of that is really something that we wanted to recast and use the tools that we have now, the digital tools, the tools of knowledge um, to provide a different experience, even unto how we take information um, that our, our folks who come and ponder and read our stories and enjoy them, that they, their point of view by agreement is shared forward into our technology to create a sentiment resource that will tell us where is the culture really? Because a couple months ago, we might've thought we, we knew, but we actually didn't know. And so we do need to know where is our culture? Business needs to know in order for better business decisions. So really everything about the technology side, the digital side is sort of like, you know that, that, that's where we are. And in a lot of ways, we think we're a first mover. Mm -hmm. Just, just hearing you explain that, clearly there was a need for innovation in that space. And so for any of those people that said, oh my gosh, this is the space you're going you're gonna to go into, that's the hardest, clearly you identified the gap. 
that was there. And when you take it a step further into um, the workplace, you know, and you look at the DEI spend, that's diversity, equity, and inclusion, it's eight billion a year. Some people call it 10 billion a year. And it is universally known not to be sticky or highly effective. Mm -hmm. And yet corporations are, are putting money to it because they do believe it's important to find breakthroughs and have ways for uh, teams to, to you know, create understanding and, and be more effective working together across difference. And so we see a huge opportunity there based on not tutorials or trust exercises or book clubs, not that those aren't great, uh, but on lived experience. Let's tell this person's lived experience and, and, and not ask, you know, poor, uh, you know, Sharon Lee from accounting to come in and tell everybody else what Asian American bias is like. I mean, she's already, she's already experiencing her trauma. So this I ponder at work idea is shared learning, uh, shared opportunity to, you know, really have space for self-reflection, um, personal growth. So part personal perk, uh, but also accountable because our technology is, allows us to have some analytic insight into our, how's your team doing? How's your team feeling? And not by the named individual because we always have to preserve the privacy of our ponderers. Mm, of course. Your human effort. It's human, human centered design and storytelling at its best. Kate, it's impressive what you're doing. So look forward to, to seeing how that moves forward. Um, I want to shift really quickly. Um, so Kate, we've talked about, in your case, how better media helps shape a better culture. I want to talk a, a little bit more about culture and specifically uh, within your respective organizations. So obviously we're, we're, we're talking about how important culture is and, and we can think of Peter Drucker's line, you know, uh, culture eat strategy for breakfast. Um, would love to hear though from both of you with regard to, again, purpose-driven, meaningful work that you're both doing. Um, what role do you think your culture and maintaining that in a, in a virtual world now? I mean, we've, we've had to make some shifts in how we're maintaining organizational culture um, during this pandemic for sure. And, and we'll see how that continues to evolve. Um, but how, what role do you think that culture plays in recruiting and retaining people within your own organizations and how are you maintaining that culture? Claire, I'm gonna start with you. Oh, golly. Um, I mean, I think it speaks for itself, right? Like we all know culture is important. Um, and I personally believe that culture happens when I'm not in the room. Um, and that's really where I learn the most. And so this morning I was on a phone call with one of our, our leaders and she's like, you know, Claire, um, and I, I have one direct report that's not uh, currently an executive leader at our organization. And he's like, and, um, the leader that I was speaking to, she was like, you know, Claire, yesterday I was on a phone call with um, an operation of one of my operations direct reports. And she's like, we're having this very tough conversation with our sales organization and people are butting heads. There was a lot of frustration. Um, one of our core values that stated is execute transparency, which for us means do not hide behind the problems. If people are coming to me at an executive level saying, oh yeah, our numbers look great. I'm like, mm-hmm. They never like show me the real problems. Um, and she was sharing with me, she was like, you know, um, at the end of the conversation, which is a very challenging one, um, my, uh, my operations uh, woman spoke up and said, you know, I've been at massive organizations for years and nobody had ever confronted each other on these kinds of problems. Rather, they would blame somebody else. They would say it's another department's problem. You know, it's not sales problem, it's customer success problem. So for us, culture um, really happens when I'm not in the room. And obviously that was bubbled up to me and it was really delightful to hear that our team did feel comfortable debating. Um, and then in addition to that, uh, our, our team felt comfortable in executing transparency to get to the, the root of the problem. And so that's what culture looks like at our organization. Um, it's tough in the moment, but overall it works really, really well. Um, and that's what we continue to try to strive for. And especially from offering feedback, um, 
I have learned I'm not the best at taking feedback. I'm not, I'm not. I need it in like a happy sandwich. And so I created this strategy at our organization called the Abracadabra Method. And this is like Claire's little brain child. So what Abracadabra means is Abra is actually an acronym. Abra is a tool that you can use to offer feedback. And A stands for something that you did was awesome. The next B in Abra, B stands for something that you did that was bad, not so good. R is the reason that I'm bringing it up. Not everything that you do that's bad, I'm gonna bring up, but like there's a specific reason why I'm bringing it up. And then A, the last A, A of the Abra is the action, the action that we're gonna take to move forward. And Abracadabra, just like that, we were able to offer feedback. Um, and so that's our, our organization and our culture, like taking really, and like this is natural in our company, right? We're taking really difficult conversations. Menstruation is difficult inherently, um, adding a little spunk and fun to it to get the results that we need. Um, that's in our entire brand strategy. And then also obviously, hopefully continued throughout our entire team. Um, you're welcome to use the abracadabra method wherever you want. We are we are taking note. This is recorded. You heard it here. <laughs> Claire, I love it. <laughs> you need to trademark that. I, I sure. think Claire, I would get to get as far as ab, and I'd be like, and I can't remember the third thing. So <laughs> that just might be the limitations uh, that some people that some of us have. But that is super cool. And and what I just want to um, recognize is that your ebullience your your personality um, is I think an important part of your brand because you're able to take a you know a, a, a human function and uh, you know and, and make it something that is you know can be discussed and and um, and uh, you know we can laugh and at the same time we can address what is what is a real uh, lack of uh, solutions in this area where you do have a solution so that's super cool what I would say about culture is, um, you know, a couple of my core beliefs, I believe that talent is everywhere. Um, and I have, um, I have behaved as if I believe that talent is everywhere. It takes a little bit of a, you know, it's a belief thing, right? Tenacity, belief, resilience. Mm -hmm. um, and so in believing talent is everywhere, when I was leading um, a very complex uh, organization that I built, to uh, execute the, the NCAA's 2019 men's final four, possibly the last great final four. We'll see how these events shift um, into the future. Uh, but we had you know, a book of promises that big that I owned as the bid director. And then I converted to the CEO of the organization and had to build a team. You know, I had to build a team that ultimately was 12 full-time, 12 uh, part-time, part-time folks. And early on, I got a phone call that, that went a little bit like this, you know, well, Hey, little lady, congratulations there on getting that bid. That must've been a lot of hard work. Yeah. Well, you know, that's going to be really complicated. And, uh, you know, there's a lot that uh, you're going to wish you knew. Uh, and so my organization can come in and just you know, we know all these people, we know how to do this, we've done it before, you know, what do you say? We just kind of come in and give you a hand. And that was a very important uh, moment for me. It was a bit of a gut check, a bit of a pulse check, uh, because, you know, I, I wasn't, I understood this table stakes, but I wasn't in it for sports. I was in it for how do we use sports? How do we leverage sports? to create opportunity in, in our community. And, and that was not something uh, I was willing to give away. And so um, determined that I think, you know, in terms of purpose and calling, like I'm really meant to be Miss Sports for the next couple of years and find out how sports can make a better community. And so the hiring was next and that's where this talent is everywhere thing. So I cast a very broad net for talent. Um, I, I uh, transitioned into Minnesota, uh, a woman who is now a leader at uh, Greater MSP. She's actually a senior, a senior leader in our economic development agency, which replanted here, African-American woman with background in sports, but also events. And so, you know, knowing yourself and what you're not great at is, is really important. Surrounding yourself with people who are smarter than you in areas where you don't have knowledge. Like, so, so we were awesome yin and yang. And and it kind of went from there. You know, what does our team need next? 
how, you know, let's cast that net, what will complement what we already have, um, and really thinking about, you know, not just a skill set, but an interplay, because at the end of the day, um, it was an interplay, like we knocked it out of the park because of how people's incredible capabilities in their area were able to, you know, sort of bleed over and to help and support the, the whole, whole event to have a million dollar operating surplus. Um, and the team that delivered that in Minnesota was nine out of 12 people of color, you know, 10, 10 out of 12 women. Uh, and our part-timers were, were all D1 athletes uh, of color, first-generation students with master's degrees and public, uh, you know, ad events and administration. They, you know, they wanted that career in sports and they had everything to do it, but the network. Mm -hmm. And so providing them mm -hmm. those opportunities. Uh, so culture is really important to me. And in terms of I ponder and what we're doing now, I know that we're winning because of our culture. I know that we're winning because of the team that we've put together as our senior team, because at every level of the organization, we have those different points of view. It's not perfect, we'll continue to, uh, but our editors reach out across the country so people know what it's like to be uh, you know, a black doctor in Nebraska or uh, you know, a, a farmer who's experiencing a, a second growing season because of climate change or uh, you know, all these various stories. You know, our, our network of diverse assigning editors you know, gets that story uh, you know, for us and, and tells it in an award-winning way. Mm. Impressive, Kate. Really impressive what you're doing. So uh, again, it, it just underscores you both, Claire and Kate, and sharing your stories, the importance of culture, maintaining it, and, and leading with purpose. Um, and that's obviously how you retain good people um, and, and do great things. So thank you for sharing that. Kitty, another question. Yeah. Your... <clears throat> so, and I mean, this picks up nicely from from what Kate was just sharing there. So obviously you you both have built something significant, um, even having come out of what we've all just gone through in the last year, your businesses are growing and thriving. Um, so when we think about what success looks like for you, what do you see a few years out? What do you see five and 10 years out? Sure, I'd be happy to, sure. be happy to take that one. Go so, um, you know, before five years out, uh, in the next three years, I, I would really like to see um, pondering, you know, in the sense of I-P-O-N-D-R with no E, um, becoming part of the, the nomenclature and, and meaning more thoughtful deliberation um, of, you know, whatever the, the societal issue is. Because I think we, we definitely need less tweeting, more pondering. Um, the media that's available to us today is, um, is not good for us. And uh, pondering is good for you uh, to do and expands your, your thinking and um, generates and fosters an empathetic understanding, which is, you know, it's, it's, it's as good as a 20 mile, 20 mile ride on your, uh, your bike. Uh, and so um, part of the goal would be actually that hack into the mainstream culture with a new concept that you know we're all asking for right now and especially gen z i mean our, our focus groups on gen z our focus groups on um other generations too are, are are really you know people are holding their heads saying like we can't this is not s sustainable mm -hmm. and it's really not an option forever to just kind of look away i mean we have to engage to, to know what's going on in our communities but we're bringing back the value of that um, and so, you know, pondering for sure. We, we think our iPonder at work is a uh, product of our, our company that will, will have strategic investment from, from some of the big strategic firms or the big HR firms. And we're open to that, uh, if not altogether, you know, some type of buyout. And so we're thinking about, you know, the potential for that. Uh, and then iPonder, the media and technology company, um, it just continues to generate uh, B2B opportunities for that sentiment insight that is pro-social, that impacts uh, environment and risk, and that um, allows co corporate social responsibility to land better, uh, and uh, also is a resource for future planning for higher ed, lots of other purposes, because just, you know, at, with the turn of every day, 
um, that technology gets smarter. And that's the amazing world we're in, where the guided machine learning, the guided AI, which has the right kind of guidance, meaning um, diverse guidance, diverse input, um, really becomes a, an incredible resource for good. Mm. Great, thank you. Claire. Man, five years, it's pretty simple. My job's not done until every bath bathroom outside of the home offers freely accessible menstrual products. That's what five years looks like. If it takes a little bit longer, we're gonna stick around and keep chugging towards that, but that's what it looks like. That's great. very clear. <laughs> rooting for you yes awesome. then you'll do your next cool thing claire because i have a feeling that once you solve this there'll, there'll be something else that you're like oh why haven't we gotten after that and you'll get after that mm -hmm. and, yeah. and i loved how you talked about that it needs to be intimate to you i hadn't ever really thought about that um that you know as you're thinking as as you're are trying to create change and create something you have a higher probability of success if it is intimate to you. That's beautifully stated. I think that was brilliantly said, Claire, and um, that's why so often you know people want to know like, what's your story? Tell yeah. me your story before you show me your deck. And you know you told your story so well and so succinctly. You know my my story goes back to when I was uh, 13 years old watching too much television, like a lot of people from my generation. And eventually the five o'clock news came on and. I was looking at Natalie Jacobson, the, the, the news anchor, sitting next to her husband. That's cooler than that. And, uh, you know, they were telling me what I needed to know to be a good citizen. Mm -hmm. And the public purpose in news just really ignited me and caused me to pursue a degree in journalism in which I, and I did work in uh, news and I have worked in, um, continued to be involved in, in governance with uh, uh, national media, national public media. Uh, until until very recently when I felt like, okay, first of all, news has become a disappointment. The whole machinery, if it's working, isn't working for me. And it's not meant to. Uh, and on the public media side, it's, it's great, but there are people on my team who've never, ever, ever tuned into public media. So, so you've, got, you've got a little problem with relevance there. And I just became frustrated at the pace. I mean, it was just frankly, too slow and we can move faster. Um, today, we can move a lot faster and it's just a matter of um, will and agility. And so, you know, obviously easier to, to, to think up a new company, not that it's easy to think up a new company, but then to change the big steamership of mm -hmm. conglomerate media. And so we're just gonna take advantage of that, you know, um, that pace and hope that we, we get across this period of time of, of being a new venture to some, some steady uh, uh, investor support, profitability, et cetera. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's great. Thank you both. Well, we, we are, we're, we're coming to the top of the hour here, but I do, I do have one final question for both of you. Um, we, our capsule are a design firm, design thinkers. We've touched on design thinking today and, and both of your organizations and how you lead with purpose. Um, but I'd love to, to, to end with a question around what great design, you know, bad design. We at Capsule describe this as jank or swank is what we've used in the past. Um, I'd love to hear from both of you um, a story of either jank or swank, so bad or great design, which can be anything from, from a shopping experience and retail, you know, restaurant brand, an iPhone app. Can you both share one jank and swank example in your lives that, uh, uh, with regard to design? Who wants to start with that? Who has an answer to that that would like to lead? I can go. And obviously I have to talk about the bathroom because there's a lot of jank within the bathroom. Um, sure. So for people that haven't been in a predominantly women's bathroom, the jankiest thing are those coin operated tampon and pad dispensers. What happens is you first have to find a quarter to use it. Nobody carries around quarters. And then if you do find a quarter, you have to put the quarter in, turn the knob, and then hopefully a product comes out. The other janky part about it is it's this giant metal box that looks like it was created in the 40s because it probably was, and it's been there for decades. Um, and so that's the jank. 
I like to believe that our dispenser is swank uh, because it does have the window so people can visualize and see that the product is available to them. They mm -hmm. don't have to find a quarter. The button is easily accessible. Um, we include Braille uh, on all of our dispensers as well. One of our core design values is engage in inclusivity, which means that we design for all with an ADA compliant design as well as accessible for um, any user to be able to get that product. Um, so that's the jank and that's the swank. I know I probably took it right towards the company, but that's what I'm thinking about every single day, the bathroom space. So that's Kate, what about you, jank and the swank? <laughs> Sure. Well, um, I was I was going to take the high road and um, and and not throw out any jank, but but why would I do that? We're here we're here to talk about what works and what doesn't work. So I'm just going to read um, a quote as part of part of the the, the research. You can see over here, I love a whiteboard wall, uh, and so um, we've done a lot of uh, research. Everything that we produce for I Ponder at work and iPonder.com is based on factor research but definitely a lot of research about the spaces that, that we're moving into with our business. And here's a quote, I don't have attribution for it. So it's not mine. Uh, Digital media companies control and manipulate both the content users see and how they respond to each other. Mm -hmm. Top down decisions maximize some behavior over others. That's Jake. Okay, so so that used in, in the wrong way, in the jaded, in the cynical way, in the way it is being used by giant conglomerate companies, which own 90% of traditional media in America, um, that, that's the jank that, that we exist to, um, to, to shift. But Swank, there's been some great things in the last year. One of them is you go into the restaurant like this, and I was never much for QR codes, but, but now I can just go, boop, boop, what's the menu? I keep my mask on, I'm able to order, I'm not touching it. You know, it's just, so I think I like the development of that. I think I mean, that's pretty, pretty slick. Um, might be the end of, of uh, wiping down the menus at the end of every day, which I remember doing when I was working in restaurants. Um, other swank, closer to my business, um, the idea of having a tech, tech stack and saying, yes, in my business, in our tech stack, that just feels really good. <laughs> that's one of the reasons I love being a CEO. I love being a founder is because I have a tech stack <laughs> and that's awesome. But there are a few components of it that are like, dang, that's really cool. And one of them is called hot jar mm -hmm. and hot jar. And as soon as my team showed this to me, I was like, I just want to get inside that hot jar. It, what it does is it shows you who's coming to your site from, it doesn't show you who, but it's like a person is accessing your site from Austria and is hanging around for three minutes and going here, then here, then here, then here, then here, then here, then here, lingering here and then leaving from there. And when we first put iPonder uh, into the world, January 11th, so you know we're a new company, uh, 14, 15 weeks old, uh, but we've um, we found some amazing things about with our technology stack uh, about our customers and our product. Um, it was so cool to be able to, I would just sit and watch recordings of people accessing iPonder.com. <laughs> so, so, so that is uh, one, one that I, I think of as pure swing. Wonderful examples of innovations that have created efficiency, certainly, and are intuitive and customer focused are forward um, for, from both of you. So, so thank you for sharing. This has been an incredible conversation. I wish we could go another hour, um, but unfortunately we have come to the end of our, our session here today. But I certainly want to thank again, Claire, Kate, for joining us today. Great conversation. Kitty for being my guest co-host today. Um, really enjoyed having you and Dynamico as a, as a sponsor. Uh, again, for those that attended or you have colleagues who, who could not attend, um, please uh, visit our YouTube channel. The link is here in the chat to see a full recording of today's session. Um, and we'll have some future sound bites to share as well. Um, and hope to see all of you that joined us today again at Think and Link uh, two weeks from now um, for our next set of speakers. Again, Claire, Kate, thank you very much. Thank you everyone for joining. And take care. Put my email in the chat in case any of your folks watching want to reach out. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you both. Bye. Bye.